Say, for the sake of argument, you are an alien, tasked with studying human behavior by the Great Galactic Committee. Now, due to your species xenobiology, you cannot and will never be able to understand human language. The only thing you can do is to observe humans and nothing else. Now, because you can't talk to humans, you can't ask them what they think they're doing. So everything you'd know about humanity will be about the structure of their society. Now, let's say the Galactic Committee drop you off somewhere here, near a major metropolitan area. Since your presence would freak people out, the committee also gave you a stealth nanosuit, and because nobody really likes walking, they also gave you a teleportation device capable of jumping small distances. So, you do your job, and observe these weird creatures. One thing you immediately notice is that humans, when procuring items to stuff their big upper orifice, would trade them for these thin rectangles, usually with ornate drawings of other humans, usually made out of shredded plants or processed underground liquid hydrocarbons. You wonder how it works, so you start following these thin rectangles. You find out these humans, up to thousands of them, would gather in these large hollow polygonal structures, and after doing some tasks for a certain amount of time, would be given the thin rectangles. Light cycle after light cycles, the humans would move back and forth within their own small polygonal structures and the bigger ones. Then, you also start to notice that humans have some sort of hierarchy. The humans that give out the thin rectangles are usually nestled in a different area within the big polygonal structures. You call these humans boss. Sometimes bosses would meet with the humans underneath them, flap their meat sound maker, and the other humans would change their behaviors. But the bosses are not at the top of the hierarchy, because there are other humans who meet with multiple bosses, unable to change the boss's behavior, and the humans underneath them. With this in mind, you start to chart the human hierarchy. And, after observing tens of thousands of humans across hundreds of light cycles, you figure out that the human hierarchy is really quite tall and really rigid. The progenies of humans at the top of the hierarchy never go below a certain level within it, usually still pretty close to the top. Humans near the bottom of the hierarchy live in much smaller polygonal structures, receive much less nourishment, live shorter lives, and seem to be in more distress. You conclude that where humans are in this hierarchy determines what resources they can acquire. As time goes on, you end up observing millions of humans, and when you graph the hierarchy, the chart is extremely wide near the bottom, with a really, really tall middle, and vanishingly small top. Plus, you keep seeing the same humans over and over again at the top, even across vast distances. And the humans atop the hierarchy are able to direct considerable resources to suit their needs just by flapping their meat sound maker. You also notice something else interesting. You wanted to know why these humans are accumulating so much stuff. Not just the thin rectangles and their digital representation, but also real tangible stuff. You couldn't make sense of it at first, because it seems like there's no rhyme or reason to production. Humans just keep on churning stuff out like they're trying to destroy the planet. Then, one day, you figure it out. The people at the top accumulate stuff, so they can accumulate even more stuff in the future. And the humans who can't accumulate stuff fast enough would keep on losing. Moving down the hierarchy though, not very much, but enough to make them seem distressed. Everyone else is just sort of along for the ride. You keep studying these humans until one day, the Great Galactic Committee calls you to end this imaginary scenario because something something. I don't know, make something up. I really need to start talking about China or risk boring people to death, or worse, people would close the video. Anyways, you might be wondering why I'm telling you this imaginary alien scenario. Well, let me ask you this. Where did the alien land, do you think? Like, given their data, would you be able to tell where the alien landed, intelligibility notwithstanding? I mean, think about it like this. If there were two aliens sent to Earth, one landed in China and the other landed in Japan, and they compare notes after their observation is over, will these two aliens conclude that these two countries have the same economic system? If these two aliens landed in, say, 1955, would the result be different? Like, if an animal quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, looks like a duck, can it be a giraffe? To truly answer that ridiculous question, we gotta dig deep and look at the history of China, how it evolved over time, how we got to where we are, and what it looks like today. So let's jump in and talk about... Before we begin, there are a couple of things I want to say. First, most of the stuff I will talk about here I lifted from Chuang, which is a Chinese leftist collective slash journal. Check them out because they're really great, especially since most of the stuff online about China is either Chinese government propaganda or American government propaganda. So if you're looking for information that doesn't come from either, go check it out. Second, the title of this video is sort of a clickbait. I mean like, I'll eventually answer the question, but that's not going to be the focus of this video. Rather, as I've said earlier, the focus is more on the history and evolution of China. And I'm going to compress 70 years of history in this video, so there are a lot of details that I won't be covering, because otherwise, this video will be like 400 hours long. So again, if you want to know more, check out Chuang. Like seriously, they're really good. 
Third, if you haven't noticed, this video is really long. So like grab some water and go pee now or something. There will be a break later though. And also, because it's really long, I'm not gonna do my usual shtick with tons of articles on screen and do more like Sean's or Three Arrows videos with articles interspersed between this screenshot of my desktop. The references will still be at the bottom of the screen though. Fourth, I'll be using a lot of acronyms and a couple of Chinese words. So there should be a glossary in the description. I mean, I don't know if you actually need it, but just in case you can't remember certain words and need to look it up, you can just pause the video and scroll down. And finally, please be nice. I know you might disagree with what I have to say, but like, just chill. I'm not one of those confrontational acerbic debate bros, so just like, don't be a dick, yeah? If you think I'm wrong somewhere, comment down below with complete citation and just like, you know, chill. Also, if you're a Chinese intelligence agent who happens to come by this video, just, you know, don't hurt me, I guess? I swear, I mean no harm to anyone. Alright, with that out of the way, let's really start. Let me tell you a story my dad used to tell me when I was a little kid. My grandfather was in the army. He was some sort of commander who would end up fighting the Japanese at the end of World War II. But this story happened before that, during the Japanese occupation of my country. The story goes, one night, one of his underlings told him that the Japanese were about to raid his house because they found out he was conspiring against them. Which was absolutely true. He was working for the liberation of the country. And so, he told his wife, my grandmother, to leave the house. Then, he grabbed one of those big-ass Rambo-style machine gun and a bandolier with dozens of hand grenades. And let me reiterate, this is not my story, this is my dad's story. Anyways, with a machine gun in hand and grenades slung all around his body, he made his way to a room in the middle of the house. He was prepared to fight to the death with guns ablazing if necessary. He waited a couple of minutes. And then, he started to hear quiet footsteps from afar. The footsteps got louder and louder, and suddenly, the door flung open. But he didn't fire. And neither did they. Everything stayed quiet. A Japanese soldier entered the room, looked around, and then left. Are you confused? It is at this point that my dad would reveal the twist. For you see, my grandfather was wearing an amulet that made him invisible. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that story actually happened. I mean, don't get me wrong, Japan did invade Southeast Asia in the 1940s, but my dad's story is most definitely not what happened. But he's not lying, is he? He's telling a story with a certain narrative in his mind. One that is designed to make my grandfather seems almost magical, if you will. This kind of narrative building is part of our human nature. But sometimes, it hides the reality of the situation, often leading us to the wrong conclusion. But enough foreshadowing. Let's go back to the history of Asia. Both of my grandfathers did fight Japan. That much is true. Japan invaded the whole Southeast Asia under the pretense of freeing us from European colonialism. But of course, they only wanted to replace it with their own colonialism and establish what they called Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Essentially a hierarchical system with them at the top. Now, if we want to understand China, this is where we have to start. While Japan's imperial ambitions started with the occupation of the Korean Peninsula in 1910, for our purposes, we'll jump straight to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. See, at the dawn of the 20th century, Japan was able to industrialize rapidly and transform itself into a capitalist powerhouse. Along with this, a fervent militarism developed and fascist politicians were able to take power. And just like other capitalist countries, Japan eventually hit an economic crisis of declining profitability due to rising wages and market saturation. This was exactly what happened in the West in the 1970s, which resulted in neoliberalism. But here, due to Japan's colonial, militaristic, and fascistic policies, they decided to invade Manchuria instead, build a new industrial base, and forcefully open a new market there. Essentially, this expansion was an attempt to reduce labor costs and expand their market. But this also meant that Japan invested heavily in Manchuria, building factories and infrastructure, exporting capital goods, that is goods that are used to produce other goods, and establish industrial structure in the region. They did it to exploit cheap Chinese workers using a feudal-ish labor structure, and combined, the industrial production in these areas were twice as much as the entirety of China's pre-war industry, mostly driven by the wartime production. After Japan lost the war, the region was returned to China, but it was to the hands of Kuomintang, or GMD. See, before the invasion, China was stricken by a civil war between the nationalist GMD and the Communist Party of China, or CPC. But only GMD was recognized by the world due to, you know, the whole communism thing. So after World War II, Manchuria was handed over to the GMD, who promptly lost the civil war, and Manchuria was eventually handed to the CPC. But, after the invasion of Japan and the Civil War, much of the Chinese economy was obliterated. With the American invasion of mainland East Asia seeming to loom over the horizon, CPC's first priority was to rebuild the industrial base of China. But there were a couple of problems. First, the only existing heavy industrial production facilities were located in the northeastern region where Manchuria is, built by Japan and inherited from GMD. The problem was that there was no infrastructure connecting Manchuria to the rest of China, making it impossible for goods to flow south. Second, even if there was infrastructure connecting Manchuria, they still needed technical assistance to operate the machinery and establish the bureaucracy required to manage these factories. 
Third, even before the war, China was mostly a rural country, with decentralized production of goods spread over a large area in the countryside. On top of that, most of the economy, outside of Manchuria, was made up of self-sufficient, localized and geographically dispersed artisans, handicraftsmen and small farmers in rural areas, while the coastal cities had small light industries that survived the war. China would need to unify all of these disparate regions if it were to industrialize. Fourth, industrialization requires boatloads of grain to feed the people building all the stuff. After the war, grain production was barely able to feed the population itself, so agricultural production would need to increase, but without increasing the number of farmers, since labor was needed to build the industrial base. That's only ever possible if agriculture is modernized and mechanized, which won't happen until the 1970s in China, but we'll get to that later. All of these meant that the state had to refocus its development efforts in urban areas, where industries could actually be established. As Mao Zedong himself said in March 1949, the center of gravity of the party's work has shifted from the village to the city. He needed to stitch together a national economy, connecting urban areas with each other and with rural areas. One that lined up with the goals of communism and, due to his Marxist-Leninist heritage, this was to be accomplished through central planning. This meant that industries in coastal cities would have to be seized by the state. Well, that was the theory. In reality, the central state couldn't just seize them. Unlike with land appropriation from landlords, they would need to rebuild the necessary bureaucracy and management from the ground up, and there was not enough manpower in the party for that. Essentially, they had to keep the pre-existing capitalist structure in urban areas for a little bit longer. So the state used a two-pronged approach for industrial development, Sino-Russian friendship for fixed capital and technicians, and capitalist appeasement in urban areas. The first one involved $300 million loan from the USSR to rebuild a heavy industrial base in Manchuria. On top of that, the USSR also sent technicians to get the production up and running as fast as possible and train Chinese engineers. The second approach essentially boiled down to utilizing the elements of capitalism the party thought were beneficial and not harmful to the national economy. In other words, they wanted to control and not eliminate capitalism, at least for now. See, after the Civil War, in many southern port cities, private owners and non-state managers remained present, using their technical skill and access to foreign credit in exchange for favorable treatment by the party. It made sense then for the party to utilize them to get the industries running back up. In fact, by 1953, approximately 80% of the managerial personnel were of bourgeois background and 37% of these were pre-1949 graduates, return overseas Chinese students or factory owners. While some parts of capitalism were allowed, the government reined in on the volatility of the market. The only stock exchange in Shanghai was closed down, and all government funds were concentrated in the state banks. But this ended up slowing down production and the closure of about 10% of all commercial establishment. In response, the government provided a massive stimulus, which, coupled with the Korean War, were able to jumpstart production again. Now, if you think this looks like capitalism starting up again, well, you're not alone. By the early 1950s, the coastal factory workers were not happy with the capitalist-esque development, and worried that this would lead to China transitioning to capitalism. So, the state responded to this dissatisfaction by increasing wages and creating mass organizations, including new unions and a national labor board to provide less disruptive means to solve workplace grievances. Finally, after higher wages and other concessions could no longer be given, the party responded with the democratic reform movement. That reform movement took the form of mobilizing millions of workers to denounce their employers, which provided catharsis for the workers. But the mass mobilization ended up disrupting production. Obviously, if you're being mobilized all day to attack your employers, nothing will get done, hence disrupting the production. The campaign also resulted in many private enterprises closing down, effectively crippling the influence of private capital in China. But what the state feared the most was that it also set a precedent for giving workers power over their managers and enterprise owners, which they did not want. Fearing demands of seizures of enterprises by workers, the state began rolling back the reform movement. So capital lost power, and the economy was reoriented around the state. It became central to production, and they were able to create a commercial infrastructure to replace the privately owned market. State retail stores and corporations increased massively between 1950 and 1952. Rural production and marketing were connected to urban consumer co-ops, state stores, and other co-ops. Essentially, they succeeded in creating a single socialist commercial network. Now, let me ask you this. Have you heard all of this before? If you live in the West, you probably didn't realize how the Chinese economy actually functioned under Mao. You were probably told that Mao was an authoritarian or even a totalitarian, but that's not exactly correct. The government, at that time, was pretty responsive to people's demands, especially the urbanites. In fact, this whole thing was widely accepted among the workers, despite disappointment and agitations here and there. Most workers actually limited their attacks to the enterprises and the managers themselves instead of the state. So, just like my dad's story, the narratives about China created by Western government and the media were made to sell you a certain point of view. But instead of making my grandpa seem like a cool dude, these narratives only served the interests of capital, making it seem like this era of socialism was a failure. But this goes both ways too, because the modern Chinese government narrative about this era isn't accurate either. 
It makes it seem like what the government did was solely driven by ideology, while in reality they had to contend with material limitations and was mostly driven by the material conditions on the ground. And there was one especially important material limitation they could not fix, namely the agricultural production problem. The solution they came up with would end up haunting China even to this day. So let's move on and talk about... Now, if you go to my Twitter, my bio says that I'm a... some sort of socialist. There are two reasons for this. First, I actually appreciate adroit alliterations. They are totally, transcendentally thrilling to think through. Second, I'm still unsure what metaphorical toppings my socialism pizza should have. I believe in workers and communities owning the means of production for use instead of for profit. But how that should be done, what counts as workers and communities, what means of production are, how can production for use be stable, etc, etc, are a matter of debate. For example, Marxist-Leninist Maoists, or MLMs, believe that a vanguard party or the state can be the representatives of the people, and as such, them owning the means of production still falls under socialism, though that usually pertains more to the industrial production. On the other hand, they believe land should be owned collectively by the people who are using it. There are other metaphorical toppings for MLM pizza, but this is enough for our purposes. The question then, was China following their own standards of socialism? Did they have socialist policies? Well see, what was supposed to happen, what they wanted to do, was to collectivize agriculture and nationalize industry in stages. And it kinda happened, but it didn't exactly cohere into a complete, consistent, and reproducible mode of production. Instead, a mishmash of different modes of production sort of organically developed by itself in certain areas, while other modes were imposed on other regions by the central government, more so in the countryside. Alright, let's start with the industries. The government aimed to nationalize production in five stages. In the first stage, the so-called bureaucratic capital and foreign enterprises were seized. In this instance, bureaucratic capital consisted of the important industries necessary for development, so stuff like electricity, iron, steel, coal, cement, and so on and so on. In the second stage, banks are nationalized. After the Civil War, private banks were indeed nationalized. 52% of all private banks were closed and the rest were consolidated into one national bank. The third stage, nationalizing private firms and factories, was implemented by turning the enterprises into official joint enterprises between the state and the private owner. Before, the state would contract them for production, but now production was guided by the state plan targets, and the ultimate authority was transferred from investors and owners to the state. To soften backlash from the former owners of these enterprises, the state reimbursed them at a fixed rate of interest out of future revenue. The implementation of the third stage involved 3 million private firms and factories and directly affected 70 million people, completely restructuring the industrial organization from the ground up, mostly in coastal cities, where there were a lot of private enterprises. It was hoped that this nationalization would stop China transitioning to capitalism, and it kind of worked for a little bit. The fourth stage was the formation of co-ops for handicraftsmen and artisans in rural areas. It was implemented by encouraging small rural businesses to first join co-ops called supply and marketing cooperatives, and then producer cooperatives. This co-op would see the handicraftsmen and artisans pooling their labor together to obtain cheaper raw material, marketing their products, and pooling their profits and collectively manage it themselves. The produced goods were directly sold to the state, essentially abolishing private merchants. After the first four stages were implemented, the state became the sole driver of production through planning, because the law of value could not dictate investment, goods distribution, and people's movement anymore. See, to make an economy work, a complex system of coordination is absolutely essential. In a market economy, that coordination comes in the form of, well, the market itself. Private individuals buy and sell goods for profit, which forms networks of trade and distribution that coordinate production. So during this era in China, money, wages, profits, and banks still ostensibly existed, but they only serve as ways to plan and quantize the economy and coordinate production, and capital accumulation was not the primary directive of the economy. The state essentially had to replace a ginormous private trade network with a planned one, so goods can be distributed to make sure production ran smoothly. However, if that sounds really difficult to make it work smoothly, well, you're right. Perverse incentives led to wastes, inefficiencies, and corruption, where, for example, managers would inflate production numbers to satisfy the central planners. The state tried to fix this by allowing the workers to participate in planning and supervise production. It was thought that by including workers in management, production numbers would actually increase so that the managers wouldn't have to inflate production numbers. But it didn't really work. Workers and machinery still had to work to their breaking point because the problem was poor equipment and lack of training, which only investment can fix. Another side effect of central planning was the ballooning number of party bureaucrats because again, managing a planned economic system over a vast area was incredibly difficult and would be impossible without a shit ton of people. This increase in bureaucrats was driven by two competing methods of industrial organization developing in China, the Soviet model and the East China model. 
To put it simply, the Soviet model favors large-scale heavy industries managed by technicians, mostly Soviet or Soviet-trained Chinese and party members, with some input from the workers through workers' councils, while the East China model favors distributed production, where many small to medium-sized industries supported a few large industries, with distribution between those enterprises managed by the local party apparatus. These two organizational methods competed with one another and ended up influencing and modifying each other, along with future organizational methods. And, as the name suggests, the East China model was implemented in coastal cities, whereas the Soviet model was implemented mostly in Manchuria. But having said all of that, from 1952 to 1957, that developmental push was, well, developing the economy pretty nicely. From a baseline of abject poverty due to wars and conflicts, China was able to vastly increase national income and industrial production. The groundwork for sustainable future growth was also laid through massive investment in education and training, which led to rapid mobility as farmers urbanized and students entered college. But after people's income rose, so did inflation. To combat it, the state provided food and basic necessities to urban workers. This was the start of Danwei, or translated as work unit in English. It provided food and basic necessities to workers, and functioned to reduce labor turnover, stave off inflation, and make workers directly dependent on the central state's allotments of resources, rather than monetary wages. Danwei can be seen as an attempt by the state to decommodify labor, and as such, its removal later would signal an economic transition in China. But we'll get to that later. For now, just remember that it's called Danwei and it means the provision of basic necessities to urban workers with stuff like housing and food. If you forget later, it should be in the glossary. However, by 1957, there were unrests in coastal cities. See, because the state invested heavily in developing new industrial areas, already existing cities were left underfunded. On top of that, these cities' outputs were mostly focused on light industries, such as textiles and consumer goods, while the state was focused on developing heavy industries to further accelerate industrial development. The workers in these areas also saw the benefits that had wrested from factory owners over the past decade gradually stripped away, which meant that they had to deal with less workers' management, long working hours, and falling wages, though some of the falling wages were offset by Dan Wei. Meanwhile, management and bureaucracy expanded greatly, which was seen by workers as unproductive. Workers' anger, especially young and migrant workers, spilled onto the streets as strikes became widespread. This led the government to launch 100 Flowers Campaign, where workers were allowed to air their grievances against the state and the management. But when the demands became untenable and workers started to echo the Hungarian Rebellion of 1956, the government turned around, repressed the strikes, and rolled back the campaign. People who were too harshly critical of the state were severely punished. And, due to the divisions among the workers, a seed of yet another revolution was quashed. The thing though, the government couldn't actually fulfill all of the workers' demands because there was a structural economic problem underneath all of this mess. See, this type of planned economy required a gigantic number of bureaucrats, which drained the resources out of the state's budget. On top of that, focusing on industrial development meant that most investment would have to be funneled to either building those industries or other infrastructure required to build those same industries, instead of being used to increase wages, for example. This actually led to overinvestment which caused the bottleneck in production and caused shortages. On top of on top of that, there was a massive migration from the countryside to the cities, so China had a lot of pissed off workers the government had to appease or, more realistically, repress. The problems in the urban areas would eventually converge with the problems in the rural areas, so let's shift gears and talk about the rural areas. Simply put, the state policies resulted in the destruction of the previous modes of production in the countryside. Many small handicraft industries that had been existing for hundreds of years were wiped out because the goods they were producing could not be sold on the market anymore as it was dismantled by the state. Trade networks that had existed for centuries were destroyed and the state couldn't replace them completely. This essentially pushed many former handicraftsmen and artisans into agricultural work or migrate to the cities. See, the state wanted to boost agricultural output, so the rural production was collectivized, and this was to be done in four stages. In the first stage, mutual aid teams of six or more households were formed with the aim of assisting production on individual farms. This usually amounted to sharing work animals, utilities, and other scarce resources, and was largely a local and voluntary response after the landlord class was abolished. In the second stage, most mutual aid teams were consolidated into lower agricultural producers' cooperatives, consisting of groups of about 20 households. It's important to note that this wasn't forced on the peasants. Rather, the government used financial credit and technical aid as incentives to join. By 1956, 98% of rural households were members of the cooperatives. Anyways, at this point, agricultural output was growing, but slower than expected. There were two factions within the government with two different ideas on what to do next. The majority of the CPC Central Committee seemed to favor slower collectivization, and were worried that things would be disorderly if cooperatives expanded too rapidly. Mao Zedong, on the other hand, favored rapid collectivization. There were two reasons for this. First, to develop industries, the government needed to feed the people building said industries, which required the extraction of grain surplus from their rural areas. 
With a growing urban population, thus a growing grain requirement, the government needed to modernize agriculture, but there was a problem. See, much of the Chinese countryside lacked the necessary infrastructure to support modern agriculture. Roads, rails, electricity, and so on and so on, did not exist in many areas in rural China. So heavy industries were needed to develop them. But to build those heavy industries, you need people supported by modernized agriculture. So they were caught in a catch-22. Mao believed that accelerating industrial development would enable them to break through that catch-22. Second, this was around the same time the Sino-Soviet relations were deteriorating, which meant that China was getting less assistance from the USSR. But more than that, it also meant China had to beef up its military, which required industrial expansion just in case a war breaks out, either with the USSR or the US. But Mao was able to push the policies through the government, and from 1956 to 1957, the third stage of rural collectivization was implemented. The lower stage producer cooperatives were turned into collectives in which individual households gave up their ownership of land, livestock, and agricultural implements to collectives of between 40 to 200 households. Essentially, this was done to increase the amount of grain surplus the state could wring out of the peasants so it could accelerate industrial development. The government also started to implement the Huko registration system. Huko is a residency registration system that essentially locks people into either rural areas or urban areas. Its main purpose is to control rural to urban migration, since rural Huko holders cannot migrate to the cities without authorization and do not get the same social services offered to people with urban Huko. Note that I'm using the present tense here. This, along with Danwei, will be really important later, so let's put that in the glossary. Remember, Huko is a residency registration system, and an individual can either hold rural Huko or urban Huko. So this is where the urban and rural problems converged. Remember, there were unrests in urban areas and overinvestment led to a production bottleneck. To escape that bottleneck, they wanted to accelerate industrial development even further, while at the same time meeting some of the urban workers' demands. Both of these required an increase in grain extraction from rural areas. And so, the state enacted the Great Leap Forward, or GLF for short, which was aimed at accelerating industrial development by decentralizing production and increasing grain surplus extraction by building rural agricultural infrastructure. It's an important acronym, so it should be in the glossary. I'm pretty sure you've heard of it before. It caused a famine that killed between 15 to 45 million people in three years. A significant number of people in such a short time. What happened? See, after the third stage of collectivization, even larger communes sprung up locally and organically in many rural areas. Whereas the third stage collectivization units consisted of between 40 to 200 households, these communes encompassed a whole town and its surrounding villages with tens of thousands of members. Originally, these communes were not planned centrally, but rather arose as a response to local conditions and the need to deploy large-scale labor force to build massive agricultural infrastructure such as irrigation and reservoirs, which was necessary for increasing productivity. After seeing this, the central government adopted the practice and spread it to the rest of China. They also set up commune and brigade enterprises, or CBEs, which were essentially big collective co-ops spanning many villages with thousands of people consolidated from many smaller co-ops. CBEs will be quite important later on in our story, so it should be in the glossary. These communes were portrayed as a quick way to communism. As stated by the Central Committee, the realization of communism in our country is not far off. We should actively exploit the people's commune model and discover the concrete means by which to make the transition to communism. But here's the problem. These communes were established to build large-scale infrastructure projects and develop rural industries, and they did exactly that. Around 100 million peasants were moved from agricultural work to building rural infrastructure and industrial projects. I mean, imagine a third of America, all of them are farmers, suddenly stop working on agriculture and do something else. You see the problem now, right? Fewer agricultural workers led to decreasing grain production, which led to the famine. But even then, the worst of the famine wouldn't have been so catastrophic had the government just like, chill the fuck out a little bit. See, when the government collectivized land in the fourth stage, they really collectivized it. Before the fourth stage, peasants actually had small private plots of land that could be used as a buffer against bad harvest, but the party put that under the control of the collective. And worse, many communes and their production were controlled by people whose main goal was to appease the central government instead of the local people, which led to over-extraction. This was unlike the earlier stages of collectivization, where peasants' collectives at the village level had control over their land. What's left of the private market for grain and agricultural goods completely disappeared, replaced with communal dining halls with some offering free food. These dining halls and the large size of the communes made it almost impossible for peasants to see how their labor affected their own subsistence, and thus led to the breakdown of accounting and remuneration system. All of these led to crop yields reduction in 1959 and famine began to ravage the countryside, which drove peasants out of the rural areas. Side note, there's an article written by Twitter user Ice Must Be Destroyed, nice name, and Frightful Hobgoblin or It It Maker 3, I don't know, focusing more deeply on GLF and the peasantry. I highly recommend it if you want to know more about the dynamics between the government, whether local or central governments, and the peasants. What's surprising to me is the fact that the peasants didn't revolt against the party this time, even though it was mostly the peasants that manned the communist revolution. It's a great read, really in depth.
All right, let's talk about GLF policies in urban areas. I don't know if you noticed, but earlier I said nationalization was to be done in five stages, and yet I've only described four. Well, like in rural areas, the fifth stage of nationalization is the establishment of urban communes. This entailed extending downway provisions by, for example, setting up tens of thousands of dining rooms to serve meals to millions of people. On top of that, approximately 50,000 nurseries provided accommodations for some 1.46 million children. And in the beginning of March 1960, there were 55,000 service centers rendering assistance to approximately 450,000 people. These service centers provided laundry, tailoring, repairing, hairdressing, bathing, house cleaning, and health protecting services. Essentially, housework was socialized, which freed up women workers for production. To appease restive workers, CPC forced the supervisors and party cadres to participate in manual labor, and gave workers some voice in management. Migrant and new urban workers were incorporated into regular employment with access to Danway. Extending Danway also meant that they had to build new housing and new medical and educational facilities. But this strained the state's resources, which necessitated even more green extraction from the countryside. But the most important thing GLF did in urban areas was the decentralization of industrial governance. Control of some industries was shifted down to more local levels, like to the city. Targets from central government were not absolute anymore. Instead, local authorities were allowed to set and even speculate their own output targets, though the bulk of their profit still had to be sent to the central government. Nonetheless, that little bit of profit incentivized local leaders to compete against one another, ramp up production, and sometimes even over-report actual production numbers. The decentralization also allowed enterprise to recruit from society directly. Before, recruitment was controlled by the central government, who had complete authority over labor allocation. This led to a boom of the urban population, mostly migrants from rural areas. In the span of several months beginning in 1958, around 3 million peasants migrated to urban areas, starving the countryside of much-needed agricultural labor. But, while GLF urban policies were effective at appeasing workers, output target speculation eventually led to an economic crisis. Without a reliable way to quantify production, investment became unstable and production was disrupted. This was made worse by the chaotic nature of the decentralization as different segments of local authorities competed for control over the new industries. Essentially, the central state had lost control, and with a famine ravaging the countryside, they had to do something and reined in the chaos. Before we move on to the government's response to all of this mess, let's ask ourselves, was this socialism? I mean, one thing for certain is that this wasn't capitalism, because capital accumulation couldn't happen. Instead, it was a mishmash of different modes of production, usually unstable and kept changing over short periods of time. Different regions would have multitudes of different modes of production, and a region could have two different modes of production in different time periods. You can argue it was tending towards some sort of socialism, but it was never completed. The only driving force behind the economy was the push for development. To quote Chuang, China between the 1950s and 1970s was neither a replication of Russian socialism, nor was it state capitalist, nor was it simply a process of government-facilitated proto-capitalist original accumulation, as in the other developmental states in the region, nor was it a continuation of some age-old oriental despotism. It was also not a period in which lingering tendencies toward capitalism wrestled with nascent tendencies toward communism in a situation of two-line struggle, requiring a permanent revolution to complete, as certain factions within the party would argue. It was an uneven, constantly changing regime of development cobbled together from inconsistent elements. Its only true unifying factor was a developmental push itself, founded on the siphoning of grain surplus from countryside to city. As we go forward in time, it'll become clear that China's economic evolution was never intentionally planned. There was no grand plan put forth by its leadership, no coherent strategy that would have led China to one economic system, whatever it may be. Decisions were made due to historical inertia on one hand, the momentum of masses of people on the other, and material limitations on the other other hand. Essentially, the China that we know today is the result of cobbled together haphazard and contingent policies, with chaotic transitions mixed in every now and then. Speaking of which... Let's take a break real quick, yeah? Grab some water or something, we're like halfway there. You can pause the video if you want, but I'm just gonna ramble for a minute before we continue on. So, uh, do you like chicken? Here's a chicken who roams around my neighborhood. It's really goddamn aggressive, and it's just so mean. Like, if I walk too close to it, the thing would just chase me and shit. I guess it used to be a dinosaur or something, so the angry genes are still there. You know what's interesting about chicken, though? Chickens, and really all birds in general, actually evolved feathers before they could fly. I mean, just look at dinosaurs. They had feathers, too. Feathers were actually used for heat regulation at first, but when some birds evolved to fly, this already existing structure really helped them master the skies. It's a phenomenon called exaptation, in which a trait used for one function ended up beneficial for other functions unrelated to the first one. Pretty interesting, right? Now, why did I tell you all of this? I don't know, maybe it'll be relevant later, we'll see. Anyways, break's over, let's recap. Unrest in urban areas caused by a structural problem within the Chinese economy led the government to accelerate industrial development, which led to the over-extraction of grain from the countryside. 
Due to the governance structure of rural areas, peasants and local authorities were not able to control the flow of grain, nor were they able to see how their labor affected grain production, which contributed to the problem of overextraction. Infrastructure and industrial projects mobilized hundreds of millions of agricultural workers, significantly reducing the available labor for agriculture, which led to the problem of food underproduction. As grain was siphoned off from the countryside to cities, a famine started, which would end up killing tens of millions of people. This led to even more people fleeing the countryside to urban areas, worsening the agricultural labor situation. While this was happening, decentralization had caused the crisis of overspeculation in urban areas, disrupting investment and industrial production. So I think it's fair to say that JLF was an abject failure. Its goal of accelerating development did not materialize, and Chuang argues this was the starting point in what would become the collapse of the communist project in China, and thus starting its transition into capitalism. Through the famine, the government began to lose their popular mandate among the peasantry, and as its popular mandate was lost, the communist project was thrown up at the roots to feed the developmental regime. The opposing potentials that arose did so within the party, becoming factional conflicts and later purges. If the first step in the dissolution of the communist project was its absorption into the body of the CPC, the second step was the purification of this body in the name of securing development. But first things first, the government had to fix the famine and the crisis. First, basic necessities were rationed for obvious reasons, and resources were funneled back to the countryside. Additional food was bought from the international market, while domestically, limited grain markets were reopened with the hopes of increasing food supply. Agricultural production management was devolved back down to the village level from the commune level, though it was still collectivized. Most rural economic activities were dropped in favor of agriculture, which closed down most CBEs. Agriculture remuneration system kept changing, as the government experimented with many different types of compensation systems to increase production until it settled on household contract system. The system contracted grain production to groups of households, and sometimes even individual households, with specific quotas attached, which were exchanged for cash or work points. By 1962, agricultural production slowly began to grow again, though it remained not mechanized and investment remained low. Side note, as I was editing this, I realized I never actually defined what work points are, so I'm just gonna do it here. I mean, the name is pretty descriptive enough, but essentially they were used to track how much labor a person has done over a period of time. The work points can then be traded for cash, grain, or other products. It's like money, but you can only trade it with the government. Or like those tickets you get from the arcades, something like that. In urban areas, control over the industries was re-centralized, while downway provisions were reduced. That last part meant that welfare was reduced, workday was limited to 8 hours, and the wage system was restored to how it was before the GLF, among other things. And though ostensibly called recentralization, it wasn't exactly a complete centralization. Management over the economy didn't actually go back to the central government, but rather to the provincial level, which is the equivalent to states in the US. During GLF, decentralization led to power shifting chaotically all over the place, including to the city level, the county level, the district level, etc. etc. In this case, then, recentralization meant that the management over the economy was middle-heavy, with provincial governments holding the most power in how to manage the economy, while the central government just set the targets. And to this day, it's still more or less like this. Next, the government needed to stem the tide of migrants fleeing rural areas, so the hukou system was modified. Now, peasants can't move to the urban areas without proper authorization, which was difficult to obtain, and even if they get it, they don't get the same downway privileges as urban hukou holders. The industrial workforce was significantly scaled back by sending literally tens of millions of people back to their villages in the countryside. And again, this was possible due to hukou registration system. One important thing to note also is the fact that hukou status is heritable through the mother, meaning a child would have the same hukou status of their mother. And like recentralization, to this very day, the hukou system has more or less stayed the same and remains a central feature of class division in China, but we'll get to that later. Facing the risk of stagnating productivity due to a massive reduction in workforce, CPC leadership encouraged factory managers and local officials to recruit back temporary workers. You know, the same workers that were just deported, but this time, due to their rural hukou, with reduced wages, no downway provisions, and could be sent back during the growing season. And again, because these workers had rural hukou, they could be sent back at any time, effectively reducing any bargaining power they had. By 1964, things had stabilized somewhat, allowing the state to start a new investment drive. Around the same time, America was ramping up its wars to contain communism, and Sino-Soviet relations had completely broken down. Increasingly isolated, China became heavily focused on self-sufficiency and started to invest in regions with geostrategic importance, mostly in the interior, far from the coast or the China-USSR border. On top of that, after realizing agricultural production wouldn't increase without some sort of modernization, the state decided to revive and expand CBEs and county-level state enterprises to produce modern agricultural machinery, along with cement, iron, and energy, but, you know, gradually this time. 
At the same time, urban production became increasingly militarized, especially post-1969 as conflict with the USSR seeming to loom on the horizon, and political power and day-to-day -day managerial functions increasingly concentrated in the local party branches. That last part would eventually ensure the merge of the technical and the political class, as those who want to hold power were incentivized to be both red and expert. Actually, this fusion, along with the rural-urban divide, was how class would eventually come back to China, but we'll get there later. Alright, at this point, I'm going to jump to the 1970s. I'm going to skip the Cultural Revolution, because if I did, this video will be like 4 hours long, so if you want to know more about it, go read Chuang's article Sorghum and Steel Part 3 and 4. For our purposes, just know that the Cultural Revolution was supposed to be a social movement to uproot the remaining Chinese capitalist elements from society, but it ended up heavily suppressing the ultra-left faction whose ideas were similar to that of left communism and anarchism. Oh, and that the Cultural Revolution mostly happened in urban areas, and as such, it disrupted urban production. Because of that disruption, cadres in some villages near big cities retooled their CBE's production to serve neighboring urban markets while the urban production was in chaos. On top of that, many workers and technicians who were punished for participating in the unrest were sent down to the countryside, which ended up helping develop the CBEs. More importantly, local branches of the People's Bank of China, the only bank back then, heavily lent to the CBEs, with lending to collective industries increase as high as 75% in one year. It kinda started to look like capitalism, doesn't it? I mean, it's not, but it sure does kinda look like it. Nonetheless, despite the growth, people's wages continued to stagnate. Surplus from that growth was funneled to the relatively undeveloped interior parts of China to build industries and infrastructure in investment drives, which sucked money out of the coastal cities. Though it made sense why they picked the interior. After all, it's far from the China-USSR land border and far from the coast where the US would have likely invaded from. And, due to stagnating wages and shrinking welfare, coastal workers weren't happy. A new wave of industrial unrest swept through the urban areas, but because the ultra-left faction of the populace was heavily suppressed in the Cultural Revolution, the demands were mostly of liberal nature, demanding democratization and marketization. The current regime, still Mao Zedong at the time, was now explicitly named in the critiques due to his harsh treatments of dissidents, his cult of personality, and the rising new nobility of the bureaucratic class. Interestingly, the protesters started to compare China's development with nearby capitalist countries such as South Korea and Japan, and wondered why China lagged behind. Eventually, these protests would allow for the ascendancy of the market-oriented leaders after Mao's death by the ousting of his faction out of the government. What's worse, it became increasingly clear that isolation was fundamentally unsustainable economically. Before, China could depend on the USSR for capital goods, that is goods that are used to make other goods, but after the complete breakdown of the China-USSR relations, which was teetering closer and closer to war, the increasing demand for capital goods kept unfulfilled, which hampered development. Now, what would you do if you were the leader in that situation? And let me remind you, the USSR didn't particularly care for the US either, to say it mildly. Well, around the same time, seeing it as a way to drive a wedge in the socialist sphere, Nixon tried to soften the US's relationship with China, which China saw as a way out of isolation and further development. And so, China started to open its market to international capital. It started really slow. The first opening was via informal channels, beginning with the exchange of ping pong players. No, really, that's how it started, which was cool, I guess. I mean, ping pong is pretty fun to watch, I guess. Whatever. This was followed by a series of secret meetings between Zhou and Lai, China's then premier, and famed war criminal Henry Kissinger, who, on an unrelated note, killed millions of people. By the end of 1971, the US embargo against China was lifted. The next year, famed crook Richard Nixon and famed war criminal Henry Kissinger both formally visited China, which marked the first time a sitting US president visited the country. The meeting laid out the future policies in the region. You know, stuff like the US isn't seeking hegemony in the region, and there's only one China, the PRC. Huh? Taiwan? What's that? Never heard of it. Domestically, the thawing of the relationship was seen as an extremely limited program of liberalization aimed at solving the capital goods problem. The leadership hoped it would preserve and revitalize the developmental regime, and there was never any long-term plan for a transition to a market-based economy, which was exactly what would eventually happen. Instead, everything just kind of fell into place, with rural industrialization through CBEs and the diplomatic opening converging with the capitalist economic crisis of the 1970s, all of which would eventually lead to the complete marketization of the Chinese economy. All right. Let's unpack that last sentence. After Mao's death in 1976, the paramount leadership, which is like the highest political office in China, sort of, but it's informal, I don't know, it's weird. Anyways, the paramount leadership was passed to Hua Kaofeng and then passed again to Deng Xiaoping in 1978. Now, I'm gonna focus on Deng Xiaoping because he's much more important for this video. See, he was a market reformer and he did something no Chinese leadership did before him. He significantly increased agricultural investments and surprise surprise, it finally led to growth in production. Interestingly, the growth occurred even as the total sown area decreased, meaning that agricultural production per person was increasing, which then led to an increasing rural per capita income. 
But these investments only lasted a couple of years because they were getting really expensive and contributed significantly to state deficit. On top of that, the increasing rural income also caused inflation even in the cities. So by the early 1980s, state investment in agriculture was cut, and investment was left to the local levels, specifically by shifting production to contracting peasant households, who'd use their own profit for investments. The system is called Household Responsibility System, or HRS, put that in the glossary. And essentially, the way it worked was that the government would significantly reduce their quota, and peasants could now sell whatever they have left on the market at an unregulated price. So now, instead of the government eating all the profits and losses, it was now the farmers that did so. And as the agricultural production was marketized, inequality started to rise. Note that the intention was never marketization, but rather to reduce state deficit and control inflation. It just kind of fell into place. This marketization of rural production was matched by the decollectivization of rural administration. The institutional functions of the commune were replaced by the township government, and the brigade level was replaced with village leadership. The land was ostensibly still owned by the village collective, but individual farmers could produce what they wanted on it as long as they filled the low quota set by the central government, and even then, eventually they just ignored the quota altogether because there was no strong collective system to enforce it. By 1985, the government got rid of the quota system for most agricultural products. As rural production increased, CBEs too started to grow rapidly. Remember CBEs? The commune and brigade enterprises that were set up during GLF? Well, as agricultural production was marketized, the government called upon these enterprises to process the agricultural output, essentially turning them into value-added goods. But more importantly, they also recommended urban factories to outsource part of their component processing to CBEs, which formed trade networks between rural and urban areas. Eventually, CBEs would be renamed to Township and Village Enterprises, or TVEs, and these TVEs would become the main suppliers of components for urban state-owned enterprises, or SOEs. Alright, these two terms are really, really important, so let's put them in the glossary. Remember, TVE is Township and Village Enterprise, which are enterprises converted from CBEs, mostly in rural areas, while SOE is State-Owned Enterprise, mostly in urban areas. Around this time, the government also reoriented the economy towards consumer-oriented growth and emphasized the light industry. As such, to drive that growth, investments became decentralized. Now, anyone with cash could invest in some TVEs, and as these TVEs grew, they began to be more and more privately owned, as joint stock owners replaced commune or brigade ownership. TVEs also played a central role in China's reintegration into the global capitalist market, especially TVEs in the coastal regions. See, China didn't open its market everywhere at once. International capital could only operate in special economic zones, or SEZs, at first, usually in coastal areas with proximity to the global shipping lanes. Enterprises in these regions would then reorient their production towards export. For example, in Guangdong province, local officials began reorienting local agriculture and rural industries toward exports to Hong Kong. Before long, Hong Kong began to invest in these areas by supplying equipment in return for industrial products. TVEs in this region became so highly dependent on Hong Kong's economy that a recession in Hong Kong shook the area's economy. I also want to note that in this time period, most of the investment didn't come from Western countries directly, but rather from the so-called bamboo network. The bamboo network formed when the communist revolution kicked out all the bourgeois capital owners, who then fled to Taiwan and Hong Kong. When those places boom economically because America invested shitloads of money there, those capitalists became really, really wealthy. So when they needed to invest their money in 1970s, right around the time when investing in Hong Kong and Taiwan started to be unprofitable and the global economy was shaken due to an oil crisis, it was serendipitous that China was beginning to open itself to foreign capital. This meant they could park their money in China in the hopes of continuing accumulation. These foreign invested TVEs were deemed successful, and in fact, this quantum model was promoted throughout China by Premier Zhao Xiang. He emphasized that now production should be thoroughly focused on foreign trade, and pushed for TVEs to play a more pronounced role in China's foreign trade precisely because of their flexible ownership and management, which allowed them to more readily adapt to market changes. And by the late 1990s, most of these TVEs were fully privatized and operated according to the capitalist imperative of accumulation. Do you remember when I talk about birds' feathers and exaptation? Why does that sound so relevant right now? Anyways, let's talk about how the urban areas were doing. Unlike other neoliberal market reforms in places like Chile, the opening of China to the international capital didn't involve the privatization of state-owned enterprises, at least not initially. The output of the plant sector was, for the most part, kept the same because the leadership still envisioned urban SOEs to be the backbone of the Chinese economy. But as the economy was reoriented towards consumption, investment was slowly shifted from SOE's producer goods to TVE's consumer goods, housing, and services, which led to a significant decline in the importance of SOE's over the 1980s. This would have caused urban unemployment, because most urbanites were employed by SOE's, but the government eliminated the state's commercial monopoly, allowing for a massive expansion and diversification of trading and retail collectives, along with urban private peddlers, which employed millions of people. 
This greatly expanded the role of the market, even while large enterprises were still ostensibly state-owned. And actually, SOEs became even more and more dependent on the market and thus found themselves competing with other SOEs as well as newly formed TVEs and foreign firms. Competitions also meant that state investments became increasingly reliant on firms' own funds instead of centrally budgeted allocations, and profitability became the main decider on where to invest. So let's bring the urban and rural areas together. I've already mentioned that SOEs would outsource some of their production to rural TVEs, but their relationship went much deeper than that. Because value accumulation was now the main incentive for production, SOE managers were driven to expand their enterprises. One way they could accomplish this was by going to the countryside and build their own TVEs specifically tailored to produce what they needed at a much lower price, and sometimes the TVEs would even just produce the whole final product while letting the SOE sell them to the market. And in return, the township or village would receive loans, equipment, and technicians to train the TVE personnel, which in turn would increase the area's revenues and employ its people. And the economy was booming. These networks expanded so rapidly that people just assumed it would go on forever, growing infinitely without ever saturating the market. See, before this boom, demand exceeded supply by a wide margin, and shortages were common. So it made sense that people didn't expect supply to eventually exceed demand, which was exactly what would happen. The economy crashed, some TVEs and SOEs were closed down, the rest were privatized, people lost their jobs, and capital finally truly ascended. Then, many institutions and enterprises established in the name of socialism by the previous governments, like TVEs and SOEs, were morphed and reformed to serve capital accumulation, and actually helped China transition into capitalism. These institutions and enterprises were exapted, became a sort of scaffolding for the spread of capitalism. Hukou system became an essential tool for controlling labor, and, with a relatively high human development index due to its socialist healthcare and education policies, which produced high quality labor that capital didn't have to pay for, China was able to outcompete other developing countries and became the juggernaut that we know today. See, the chicken was relevant after all. And there is one event that would solidify capital's ascendancy in China. An event in 1989 that solidified the ruling class into a coherent political authority whose directives are indistinguishable from that of capitalists. Before we jump into Tiananmen Square protest, there's one question I want to ask, and it's a really basic question. What is capitalism? See, this is actually much harder to answer than you think. Is the defining characteristic of capitalism private property? Or is it market? Or both? I ask because these things existed before capitalism arose in Europe, in places like 14th century Middle East with traders trading goods from China. But we wouldn't call that capitalism now, would we? Alright, what about the private control of the means of production? That's a lot better, but what's the definition of private here? Like let's say a dictatorial government controls the day-to-day -day production of the economy. All of the profit made from that production is funneled to the ruling class, and they decide to use that capital for more capital accumulation. That's still capitalism, right? Even if the government says they're doing it in the name of the people. See, this is why I like the definition of capitalism that looks at the relationship between production, accumulation, and capital. In my humble opinion, capital accumulation should be the very center when defining capitalism. It's not merely that production is in the hands of private owners, but also that their imperative is to accumulate even more capital so that they don't get smothered by the competitions. This means the flow of money and commodity is largely driven by that imperative. In capitalism then, investments are made for the sole purpose of getting even more capital in the future, embodied in either commodities or cold hard cash. And from here, everything just falls into place. Wage labor with garbage pay, exploitation, inequality, hierarchical management, compounding growth, and so on and so on. All done in the name of accumulation. Capitalism is essentially a self-expanding system that reforms anything outside of it, shapes them according to its imperative, and consumes them. Alright, I'm pretty sure all of this talk about capitalism isn't gonna be relevant at all. So let's go back to the Tiananmen Square protest. By the mid-1980s, marketization led to a small but growing number of urbanites breaking out of Dunway and jumping into the private sector created by an expanding consumer market selling cheap goods produced by TVEs and migrant labor. As the marketization expanded, SOEs, which were the primary provider of the Dunway system, became increasingly unable to compete with the private market, straining the Dunway system itself. Coupled with high inflation and bureaucratic corruption, these factors led to urban dissatisfaction, which would eventually explode in the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests. At first, from 1986 to 1987, it was only the university students that protested, but that was easily suppressed by the government. Eventually, specifically in 1989, workers were pissed off enough that they joined the protest. But here's the thing, these two groups didn't exactly see eye to eye on the issues. These students represented the rising class of entrepreneurs and managers in the expanding market economy. I mean, they were university students for a reason. The students were mostly critical of the way the reforms were being implemented, not the content of the reforms itself, and were connected to a faction in the government led by Zhao Xiang. They wanted the reform to move faster, be better organized and more efficient, and feared corruption was going to weaken the reform. 
The workers, on the other hand, were critical of the content of the market reform itself. They flashed out in the reform sweeping China at the time, with socialist institutions like Danway dying, rampant inflation, and stagnating SOE worker wages. Workers wanted the reform to be slowed down or significantly redesigned, and they saw corruption as the emergence of a new form of class inequality. On top of that, the workers and the students, while both calling for democracy, had two very different ideas of what it should look like. The students were more or less liberal in their view of democracy, in that intellectual and elites representing the people. And weirdly enough, some students actually wanted Zhao Xiang to be a sort of dictatorship who'd implement market reforms, but like Marxist and democratic or something? I don't know, it's weird. Look up neo-authoritarianism. The workers, meanwhile, wanted democracy in the sense of democracy in the workplace, similar to the demands of the workers decades prior in China. These two factions did not like each other, and it should be pretty obvious why, right? Their goals were diametrically opposed to one another. In the beginning, the students controlled the protests and were able to organize a widespread boycott of university classes and occupy Tiananmen Square, while workers were sidelined. Eventually, though, they realized they couldn't accomplish much without the help of the workers, especially after martial law was declared. So they called for workers to do a general strike, and the workers obliged. But even then, the workers were still acting in a supporting role instead of at the front and center of the protests. I'm pretty sure you know the rest. The government deployed forces to quash the protests, suppression followed, and thousands were killed. But here's the thing. Workers were hit the hardest in terms of prison sentences and executions in the days and weeks that followed, with students getting more lenient sentences. Some of these students would even end up being absorbed by the party, which means that the students actually succeeded in their protest, though it took a long ass time to do it. See, after 1989, the economic interests of students and workers diverged even further. In the 1990s, new middle and entrepreneurial classes emerged in China, mostly filled by the same student who protested. I mean, they became university students precisely because it would allow them to benefit from the market reforms. Workers, meanwhile, were eventually laid off from SOEs, finally creating a proletariat dependent on wages, living precariously within the global manufacturing system. In the mid-1990s, workers and peasants protested their living conditions, but the students, in general, did not support them. Why would they? They were actually successful in reshaping China to their interests. The student protests, in a way, were a demand for their incorporation into the ruling party. They were the new rich, highly educated urbanites and intellectuals who supported liberalization, privatization, and marketization. The difference between them and Deng Xiaoping was that Deng was in power, and they were not. That and plus they wanted to accelerate liberalization, which would benefit them immensely. And in a way, they got their wishes. The managerial class would eventually be fused with the party and crystallize into a coherent ruling class. See, there was this question among the party throughout the 1980s as to how much power and political leverage the private capitalists should be allowed to hold because there were a large number of private capitalists who stood entirely out of the party's control. But the Tiananmen Square protest made it clear that there could be no tolerance for reforms that were out of the control of the government. So an easy fix for that was to just absorb those private capitalists into the organs of the party by opening itself to managers, intellectuals, and the newly rich. And thus, a new bourgeoisie was born. This new bourgeoisie functions as the de facto management of the state's economy with only one directive, growth at all costs, or else risk China be outcompeted and falters. This means intense resource extraction, which oftentimes paired with environmental destruction, lowering labor costs through any means necessary, including workers' repression, and developing high-tech production methods. To quote Chuang again, the defining activity of the bourgeoisie as a class is the perpetual maintenance of the material community of capital. It is in this sense that the Chinese Communist Party ultimately became a party of capital, acting as both the attendants of original accumulation and the intra-class managerial organ for the domestic bourgeoisie. And note that none of these were intentional. There was no person who conspired to turn China capitalist or form the bourgeoisie class. Rather, it just fell into place as the country took the path of least resistance. The economy morphed slowly but surely from a mishmash of arguable socialist modes of production into a definitely capitalist one. The ruling class formed out of an alliance between the political and technical elite, which eventually led to their fusion in the form of red experts or red engineers. As such, when large-scale privatization of SOEs and TVEs occurred, the ownership of those enterprises oftentimes fell into the hands of the party officials who managed them before, ostensibly under the authority of the people, and this basically folded them into the ruling class. By the 1990s, these large-scale privatizations were in full swing. Do you remember when I said TVEs were growing rapidly? That was actually a bubble, fueled by massive debts owned by a decentralized and out-of-control financial sector, and much of the TVE sector was actually not productive at all. And so, when the debt could not be repaid, a recession started, which saw consumption decline along with investment. The unemployment level increased, especially in the countryside, which, serendipitously for capital, provided a large pool of labor. So when the bubble burst, the market reformist faction, who was in power, re-centralized the financial sector to bring it under the state control. The government consolidated the financial sector and spun it off into big four banks, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, 
Agricultural Bank of China, Construction Bank, and Bank of China. Don't worry, these banks aren't really important for this video, so you don't have to memorize them. For our purposes though, just know that these banks tried to salvage all of the bad investments during the bubble by doing some financial magic shit, but failed and resulted in the Chinese financial system being really prone to even larger speculative bubbles for the sake of maintaining investment. The TDEs in the countryside, meanwhile, were either forced to close down or privatize. This meant that the dividends from the profit of the enterprises, along with their ownership, were transferred from the village and township itself into the hands of private individuals, usually the existing managers or non-local capitalists. The hope was to make TVEs more responsive to market forces and be less restricted by nepotism, petty corruption, and collective regulations. That last part, collective regulations, included the requirement to employ local residents instead of cheaper migrants. So now, a labor market forum because enterprises could hire and fire people at will. Alright, let's talk about the urban areas now. The state reformed SOEs with the aim of making them globally competitive and open to foreign investment, though as minority owners. They did this by restructuring the SOEs from a mess of disaggregated planning units into something more resembling modern corporations, and consolidated many of them into few large enterprises called Jituan or conglomerates in English. What arose is very similar to that of Korean Chaibo or Japanese Zaibatsu, which are these gigantic conglomerations of companies that make up most of their economies. Not all SOEs survived, however, as some were forced to close down. With that restructuring also came the abolishment of the Dunway system. Now, SOE's employees wouldn't get housing, healthcare, or food anymore, thus making them solely dependent on wages to survive. Many underperforming SOEs, mostly in the northeast region like Manchuria, which was where we started, were closed down or privatized, and thus workers were laid off, with most of them being older workers. But it wasn't all bad for them. Now that the enterprises didn't have to house their employees anymore, the housing units were sold off and the older laid off workers would buy most of them, who would turn around and rented them out, essentially turning them into landlords. The remaining workers were mostly migrants from rural areas fleeing the economic downturn there. See, because they hold rural huko, employers can just deport them if they start to act out. Huko then became an essential tool for controlling labor, as it gave employers way more power in the relationship. It made it difficult for migrant workers to strike or even ask for better pay. So huko ended up becoming yet another policy exapted from the socialist era that supported China's transition into capitalism. Matter of fact, to this day, most people in China still hold rural huko, even if they live in urban areas. Class then arose out of this arrangement, with rural hukou holders at the bottom. Before, urban hukou holders had done way, and rural hukou holders had collective land as the alternative subsistence methods. But after the reform, all of those things were abolished or privatized, and those who are not in the ruling or capitalist class had to work for wages without any sort of alternative. The hukou system also allows the state to divide the workers into several different groups, making collective actions harder to accomplish. And thus, the proletarianization of China's working class was complete. With privatization in full swing, the state then reoriented its economic policies. Now, GDP growth became the primary goal as the economy grew ever more dependent on constant injections of gigantic investment packages to continue said growth. Capital accumulation, also known as growth, then became the primary imperative of the state, surpassing other considerations, with most of the institutions and policies established during the socialist period gobbled up and exapted to serve that ever-expanding system. Now, you might argue that China was able to lift hundreds of millions out of poverty, which is true, but so what? The question is whether China is socialist or not. And I mean, if you're using income as the metric for poverty, then of course poverty was decreasing. The driving force behind capitalism is accumulation, both of commodities and capital, which allowed for compounding growth. Income levels skyrocketed right around the time the state reoriented its economy towards accumulation, which should tell you something. But should you use income as the end-all be-all metric, though? In a world with accelerating environmental degradation, shouldn't we at least use metrics that are best for, you know, not destroying the world? See, the strongest predictors of a country's CO2 emissions are affluence and population size, which correlates with GDP per capita, which meant that the richer a country gets, the more CO2 it emits. But what if the metric was environmental conservation, calories, education, and health? I would argue capitalism, in all of its forms, cannot deliver as good standards of living if we use that metric, especially relating to environmental conservation, especially, especially with growth at the center of it. I don't know, just a thought. Alright, let's jump to the 2000s. We really can't talk about the decade if we're not going to talk about THE event. An event in the early 2000s that changed the world and reshaped the relationships between countries in ways that we'll see unfold in the next hundreds of years. I'm of course talking about Yao Ming's draft into the Houston Rockets. See, Yao Ming's move to the NBA was not just a symbol of the complete opening of China's economy, but also their complete integration into the global capitalist system. With rapidly increasing income, a bigger and bigger portion of the Chinese population now has extra cash to spend. Obviously, being capitalists that they are, Western companies would like to get some of that sweet, sweet yuan. Thus, they started to market their products to the Chinese market. I mean, hell, that's what Marvel is doing. 
All of that stuff really started with Yao Ming's draft, which was essentially a really big marketing campaign to sell NBA products to China. Now, that is not to say that that was the sole purpose of drafting Yao Ming. From what I can gather, he was a pretty good player. Not like a gold candidate or anything, but pretty good. I'm just saying the stars aligned, if you will, in that NBA could kill two birds with one stone by getting this dude. A good player and increasing Chinese market share? They would be really stupid to not take that deal. A year before Yao Ming was drafted, China finally joined World Trade Organization, or WTO, making it easier to trade with other countries. Though China's export sector was growing in the previous years, it was around this time that the economy truly exploded. By this time, the Chinese economy had already been definitively transformed into a capitalist one, with the private sector making up the bulk of it, but with strong government control through the managers and financial instruments. As China was signing trade deals left and right, investment from other countries started to pour in, eager to exploit the newly proletarianized cheap labor and the economy fucking skyrocketed like a, like a rocket. That explosive growth was mostly driven by rural Hukou labor. Essentially, before this whole shenanigans, ruralites were underutilized in a capitalist sense. That is, their labor wasn't creating surplus value for the economy. Thus, there were a gigantic pool of cheap labor with relatively high human development standards ready to be exploited by capital. Chinese transformative growth, then, was driven by that gigantic pool of labor finally being utilized to create surplus value. Of course, just like any other capitalist country, the massive amount of investment and, you know, the fact that it's a market would create its own boom and bust cycles, though the state control of the economy made these cycles less volatile and severe. See, what they would do when a recession is about to hit is to spend an incredible amount of money through a massive government stimulus program building construction projects and infrastructure, similar to what FDR did during the New Deal. This essentially buffered the economy so that it keeps on growing. On the other side of the stimulus, though, is a rising mountain of debt. Not in the central government, mind you, but local governments and SOEs. This meant that the economy has to keep on growing indefinitely, or else risk not being able to pay the debt, and thus be forced to sell off assets, lay off workers, and other bad stuff, which would lead to massive unrest. That, and because, you know, if they want to make any profit, the economy has to keep on growing. To pay back those debts, local rural governments sold the remaining collective land to developers, which oftentimes results in unrests. The thing though, the unrest wasn't caused by ruralites losing their means of production or subsistence, i.e. farming. Most of them actually live in the cities and don't know how to farm. But, because they hold rural hukou, they are supposed to get the money when their collective land was sold. Of course, because the profit motive is the main driver, the local governments bought the land for really cheap and sold it for exorbitant prices to developers, and the ruralites have no say in the process. Thus, the unrest was caused by that discrepancy in price. This capitalist expropriation completed the decollectivization of rural areas, making wage labor the only way to subsist for ruralites. Now, what happens when the country runs out, or nearly runs out, of cheap rural hukou labor? Well, as wages rise, industrial production becomes less competitive, essentially increasing the price of goods produced in China. Now, increased price would lead to lower demand, which eventually leads to slowing growth or even economic contraction. If this happens, if China were to suddenly become less competitive, well, let's just say they would be in a gigantic trouble. And wages have been going up since the 2010s through increasing number of strikes, riots, and other workers' actions. While all of these collective actions have resulted in increased wages, with the state acquiescing to the workers' demands, those wages can't keep going up forever and will eventually lead to high inflation, higher prices, lower profit, or all of the above, which would be catastrophic for Chinese growth. Overall, this has slowed GDP growth in China, from a really high average of about 10% per year between 2000 and 2010 to around 6 to 7% since 2012. For every other country on Earth, this is still respectable, if not great, growth rate. But for China, it signifies that the economy is starting to crack. This is why China is trying to move up the production ladder, so to speak. Instead of producing cheap, low-tech, labor-intensive products, China is trying to expand to expensive, high-tech goods to keep itself competitive and continue the growth gravy train going. That's why the 13th five-year plan, the most recent one, really emphasized the high-tech industry. And that's why China's manufacturing sector is becoming a smaller and smaller part of the economy while the service sector is growing. See, this results in two things. First, China is now looking for cheaper sources of labor, hence the Belt and Road Initiative. If you didn't know, the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI, is an ongoing Chinese infrastructure project spanning the whole globe, along with massive investments in hundreds of countries. The price tag for the project is around 4 to 8 trillion dollars, which is just insane. What this does is essentially the same as what Western countries did to China, pouring in a massive amount of money so that unproductive rural labor in those countries can be utilized to produce surplus value, except for China this time. Essentially, China has to be a hegemonic power, or else risk imploding by economic contraction. Now, you can argue whether this is a good thing or not, but two things you cannot argue against are that China didn't do this out of the goodness of their hearts, and that China is essentially doing a neoliberalism to other countries, but maybe nicer this time. Just like other investments, China is looking for returns or control over certain strategic areas. 
as an aside. Didn't some famous bald guy say something about how the export of capital is the highest form of capitalism or something like that? How capital exportation is a form of imperialism? Something something imperialism, the highest form of something? I don't know, something to think about I guess. Second, this is why China tries really, really hard to keep its territories together, by all means if necessary. For example, Xinjiang is an important source of natural resources in China, especially that sweet sweet oil and coal. Domestic reserves of strategic resources like this would allow China to depend less on the international market, which can be both unstable and expensive. Meanwhile, Hong Kong represents a financial nexus in which investments flow through. Control over the island would ensure that investments can and will continue. To maintain all of this sprawling system, someone has to keep everything in check. This is where the current paramount leader Xi Jinping comes in. Essentially, China needs a strongman leader to keep everything together, willing to dish out violence when necessary and be vicious to anyone threatening the project. See, this is precisely what's happening in Xinjiang. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into it because Chuang actually has a really really good article on the suppressions of Uyghurs, and I highly highly recommend it. But there's a couple of things I wanna point out. First, yes, Uyghurs are being repressed. They face discrimination and fucked up policies set by central government. Second, repression really started after the proliferation of capital in China. See, to dig up all of that coal and oil, the state needed to invest in infrastructure first. Instead of hiring the local people, the state decided to incentivize Han Chinese to move to Xinjiang and millions of them moved there. That investment led to inflation and, due to discrimination, made life much harder for the native Uyghurs. Most high paying jobs are controlled by the Han, while Uyghurs are left to do the low paying jobs. So it shouldn't be too surprising to see that Uyghurs are way more likely to live in poverty. More importantly, the reason why the government didn't hire the local people was because it feared separatism and didn't want to give them too much power. See, after the fall of the USSR, the whole region of Central Asia was reopened after being cut off due to the Iron Curtain. People in Xinjiang were able to reconnect with their neighboring countries and saw that they were more culturally connected with them than the central state. In a sense, they rediscovered their own heritage through cultural and religious exchanges with their neighbors, which added to the whole separatist sentiment. The central government, on the other hand, needs to crush that sentiment so they can control the area's natural resources, hence the repression. So you can see why there's discontent among Uyghurs, right? This led to high-strong racial tension, in which violence was done by both sides, including mass killings. As a response, the central state implemented draconian laws against the Uyghurs in 2014. Now, almost any crime involving an Uyghur and a Han is deemed terrorism for the Uyghur, in a similar vein to America's war on terror. And if you're wondering what the criteria for being sent to re-education camps are, well, just read this. Pause the video if you want. Now, don't get me wrong, ethnic conflicts had been prevalent before 2014. What's different this time is that now the laws are racialized, in that being an Uyghur, especially a Muslim practicing Uyghur, while not illegal by itself, carries a negative weight in the eye of the law, if you will, tipping the scales against the Uyghurs. And the Uyghurs aren't the only people being suppressed. China is doing their hardest to keep Hong Kong on a short leash. After the handover of the city in 1999, Hong Kong has maintained its relative autonomy. But when a bill that would allow a person in Hong Kong to be extradited to China almost passed through its legislative body, well, let's just say shit really hits the fan with protests and unrest. The protesters in Hong Kong have five demands. The withdrawal of the extradition bill, retraction of the riot designation for the June 12 protests, amnesty for arrested protesters, inquiry into the police conduct, and implementation of universal suffrage. Here's the thing though, Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, can't actually fulfill any of those by herself. Her boss is the central government and it's up to them to grant that. And there's no way in hell they would meet those demands. See, as I have said earlier, Hong Kong is of high importance to China as it's the main financial interface between China and the outside world. At least it used to be. Now cities such as Shanghai competed as that interface. Nonetheless, Hong Kong is still an important city for China. It funnels cash and credit from the bamboo network and the west into China itself and vice versa. So losing its grip on such an integral part of the economy is just unacceptable for the government. Oh, one more thing. These protests aren't monolithic. That douche who asked for Trump support? Yeah, he's part of a minority of a minority. The movement is diverse and undeveloped, without a single prevailing ideology in control. There are right-wingers, liberals, and anti-authoritarian leftists in the movement, and they all fight for different end goals. So no, you can't generalize the protesters, because, beside the five demands, there's not really a coherent goal uniting them all. If you want to learn more about the protest, there's a leftist Hong Kong collective called Lao San who runs a blog, which I highly recommend. Alright, it's also important to note that the reason why China is trying so hard to keep its territories together goes way beyond economic reasons. There is a nationalist sentiment brewing across the populace and the state itself, which legitimizes Xi's action in Xinjiang and Hong Kong under the banner of Chinese sovereignty or something along that line. This is usually paired with Han hegemony and ethnic subsumption, but I'm not gonna get into that, so let's just move on. Anywho, do you remember when I said China is trying to move up the production ladder by becoming a high-tech manufacturer? Well, guess who else is currently the top producer of high-tech goods and feel very much threatened by that? That's right, it's Greenland. 
Just kidding, it's obviously America. If you look at it from this perspective, then this whole trade war thing going on between America and China makes complete sense. On the one hand, China is facing its own profitability crisis, with increasing wages eating up said profit and the need to move up the production ladder. On the other hand, America doesn't like competition and would like to be the world's sole superpower, so, you know. Stuck in the middle of this is Hong Kong. The city becomes a sort of proxy for this 21st century Cold War, with America exerting its soft power by supporting some protesters on the ground and China deploying police forces to quash the protests. And actually, the rest of the world, especially developing countries, are caught in the middle of this newly brewing Cold War too, with gigantic amount of money in the form of investment promises being used to buy support by both sides. Chinese investments don't only come from the government either. After finding themselves with shitloads of money, Chinese companies have now invested or straight up owned other companies, western or otherwise, integrating them even further into the global capitalist economy. In a way, this is also done to solidify Chinese hegemony, since there is no clear line dividing the Chinese government and Chinese companies. I mean just recently, China flexed its muscles and was able to make Activision Blizzard, a full-blown western capitalist company, bent its knees. This is the kind of power China seeks to expand, utilizing capitalism's own weaknesses for its own benefit. And this period really started with the draft of Yao Ming some dozens of years ago. This is the future we all will face. Stuck between two states trying to stave off their own demise by extending their power as far away as possible. Growth will eventually meet its own limitations, where accumulation is no longer possible, whether due to rising energy costs, technological stagnation, complete environmental destruction, or all of the above or something else. And we're barreling towards that, with two hegemonies duking it out on the global stage. If it feels like the last gasp of a dying economic system trying to claw its way out of its own grave, well, that's because it is. After all, infinite growth on a finite planet is just infinitely stupid. So, what now? So what does the future hold? Believe it or not, there's a strong current of right-wing fuckery growing in China right now, just like everywhere else on Earth. Young Chinese people are being pulled more and more towards the right. While, yes, there have been true Marxist movements in China supporting workers, they are always harshly opposed by the government. As such, the right wing can recruit more readily. And it makes sense, right? I mean, for example, there were leftist students who supported worker strikes, but they were disappeared by the government because they threatened the growth gravy train, while right-wing fuckery doesn't. In fact, right-wing ideologies support the current Chinese imperative of infinite growth. So if you want to imagine how future Chinese political landscape would be like, just look at literally any right-wing nationalist countries whose policies emphasize strength over everything else. And I mean, look at this. Now let's talk real quick about all of those investments China made around the world. See, there's a reason why the IMF and the World Bank impose austerity on developing nations. More money for the people means less money for the creditors. So while, yeah, those Chinese investments and loans are more forgiving in their terms, in the end, if they're not profitable, what do you think will happen? China is already taking ownership of the infrastructure it built in developing countries when debts cannot be repaid. If that turns out to be unprofitable, then what? Would China start to impose austerity measures in other countries? If not, then how would it recoup all the losses? If they can't, what do you think will happen? Do you think hundreds of billion dollar holes can just be swept under the rug? Do you see where I'm coming from? Now, I'm not saying China will disintegrate or anything, though, to be honest, I don't think our current concept of countries will survive past the 2100s, but that's not our video. What I'm saying is that China has been completely subsumed by capital and has to play by its rules. See, this is a trap that all capitalist countries see themselves fall into. Do you remember when I mentioned how strikes and such increase wages in China? Well, you have decreasing profits on one side and angry workers demanding wage increases on the other. Fixing one makes the other worse. America, and pretty much the rest of Western world, quote-unquote fix this problem with neoliberalism, exporting industrial production to, ironically, China, and destroying unions and workers' ability to bargain. Japan never got out of this problem, and now China is inching closer and closer to that point, too. So now we have a country with one point something billion people marching into a crisis, and I haven't even mentioned the Chinese demographic time bomb. Coupled with rapid environmental degradation, it wouldn't be surprising to see an existential crisis happening in China in the next, I don't know, like 30 years. With right-wing fuckery growing in online spaces among Chinese youth, well, let's just say I don't think this is gonna be pretty. Alright, after all of this, you might argue, but China is building socialism, which... Alright, sure. But what policies are they enacting towards building socialism? From my perspective, China is becoming more and more capitalist, not less. What once was an extremely regulated financial sector is now full of the same arcane financial instruments that are used in America. What once was a labor system that tried to not commodify people now exploits them through wage. Now, the main economic imperative is capital accumulation. Remember my dad's story from the beginning? Just because someone tells you a story doesn't mean it's the truth. The Chinese government can say they're socialist, or I guess socialist with Chinese characteristics, but what does that mean? Would a socialist government commodify their workers? 
Would a socialist government export so much capital to developing countries? Would a socialist government have capital accumulation as its main imperative? After all, if an animal looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it might be a chicken, but it sure as hell ain't a giraffe. Hey, thanks for watching. Um, that was a long one, wasn't it? Oh boy, that was fun. If you get it this far, don't be a dick, please, to me. I'm human, I have feelings, so, you know. If you like what I'm doing, subscribe, watch my other videos, follow me on Twitter, all that jazz. I don't know what my next video is gonna be, but it should be about something. I don't know, I guess. Oh, and also, there'll be a YouTube walkout uh, next week, Kend? Two weeks from now, I guess. Depending, well, no, it's gonna be next week by the time this video goes out, so. Um, yeah, so, like, don't use YouTube for, like, three or four days or something like that. Just Google YouTube walkout. Um, Javi, I think, is the one who's organizing it. So, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.